writing from a Roman prison in about A.D. 62, well aware that his own death may be imminent, the Apostle Paul wrote these words to the first church he had planted in Europe. He said, For to me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. If I'm to live in the flesh, that means fruitful labor for me, yet which I shall choose, I cannot tell. I'm hard-pressed between the two. Philippians 1, 21 through 23. I've found this to be for me one of the most astounding and yet hopeful statements in all of biblical scripture. When your choices are either life in a first century Gentile prison or a horrible death at the hands of your Roman oppressors and yet you cannot decide which to choose because they both present such great possibilities. Talk about perspective. Yet this wasn't simply the power of positive thinking. Paul wasn't just trying to put on a brave face or to simply look on the bright side of things because from the world's perspective there was no bright side. Not based on the, the circumstances Paul was facing. No, this was a sincerely deep sense of hopeful expectation of what was lying ahead for Paul no matter what the circumstances were that he was in or those in his very near future that he was facing because Paul's hope was not based on what this world was offering him. His hope was based on what Jesus was offering him. A life in service to Christ or eternity in the presence of Christ. To the outside world looking in, the plight of the great apostle was a hopeless cause. And yet, for Paul, it was a win-win proposition. In fact, uh, in fact, there are a lot of hopeless causes as far as this world is concerned, and chief among them today is the church of Jesus Christ. Increasingly, the church in our culture is seen as an antiquated and irrelevant religious organization that is destined to end up on the wrong side of history for refusing to redefine the unchanging gospel in deference to the ever-changing moral sensibilities of popular culture. To much of the world today, the church is a hopeless cause, and yet Jesus said that upon the proclamation of that very same unchanging gospel, I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Matthew 16, 18. You see, what the world sees is hopeless. Jesus declared unstoppable. You understand, when you are in Christ... When you're a Christian, the same is true of you because your hope is not based on what your circumstances are or what the world says about you. No, your hope is based on who Jesus is and what he says about you. And so for the believer, listen, hopelessness is actually nothing more than a false perception of reality. Believing your situation is hopeless is believing a lie because no matter what is happening in your life, no matter your circumstances, no matter what the world says about your circumstances, and actually no matter the outcome of your circumstances, your reality is the fact that you are never without hope because you are never without Christ. Paul believed that in every circumstance, no matter what was happening to him, and so must you if you're going to be able to move beyond the spiritual paralysis that believing in hopelessness inevitably produces in your life. The truth is, there are a lot of Christians who get stuck, who stop moving forward with their lives because they have more faith in what their circumstances can do to them than they have in what Christ wants to do through them in the midst of those very circumstances. But listen, every great thing that God did in someone's life in the Bible came out of impossible circumstances. Fact is, all greatness is forged in the fires of pain. There is no easy road to the heights that God has planned for your life. Listen, climbing a mountain is hard. There's no getting around it. There are obstacles all along the way. And so if you're facing something truly difficult in your life today, even something the world would describe as hopeless, look, it's not wrong to acknowledge the reality of the difficulty of those circumstances as long as you also acknowledge the reality that you are never without hope because you are never without Christ which means who you are is not simply the sum total of your circumstances. No, who you are is who God says you are, a child of God, Galatians 3, 26. A friend of Jesus, John 15, 15. 
A new creation in Christ, 2 Corinthians 5, 17. A temple where the Spirit of God lives, 1 Corinthians 6, 19. He says you're the crown of His creation, Ephesians 2, 20. Completely forgiven and cleansed from all sin, 1 John 1, 9. A citizen of heaven, Philippians 3, 20. He says you were created in the likeness of God, Ephesians 4, 24. Are you kidding me? God's messenger to the world, Acts 1, 8. Chosen by God, 1 Thessalonians 1, 4. No longer a slave, but an heir of God, Galatians 4, 7. Set free in Christ, Galatians 5, 1. He says, you're sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, Ephesians 1, 13. Greatly loved by God, Ephesians 2, 4. And more than a conqueror through Christ, Romans 8, 37. Listen, that's just to name a few. You see, if you're in Christ... Your situation isn't hopeless today, far from it. Which means if you're struggling with something today, the question isn't whether or not there's hope for you. The question is, which are you going to believe in more? Your circumstances or Jesus? Because with Jesus, there are no hopeless causes. As we're going to see in our story today, as we continue this sermon series, working our way through the gospel according to Mark, where there are some people who the world had deemed hopeless causes, people facing circumstances that by all appearances seemed well beyond hope, impossible, in fact. And yet these same people chose to believe more in who Jesus was and in what he could do than in their circumstances and what they could do. And as a result, they were able to move forward with their lives in even greater faith and strength than before because they acted on the belief that no matter what they were facing, there was hope to be found in Jesus Christ. It's something that we not only need to believe, by the way, but it's something that we need to learn to act upon as well, as we'll see today. Because look, when you face impossible circumstances in your own life, it is only by acting upon that faith in Christ to do the otherwise impossible that you can get unstuck from the lie that is hopelessness and then move forward with your life. Let's pick the story back up then where we left off last time at Mark chapter 5. We're going to begin by reading verses 21 through 24. And when Jesus had crossed again in the boat to the other side, a great crowd gathered about him, and he was beside the sea. Then came one of the rulers of the synagogue, Jairus by name, and seeing him, he fell at his feet and implored him earnestly, saying, My little daughter is at the point of death. Come and lay your hands on her so that she may be made well and live. And he went with him, and a great crowd followed him and thronged about him. So Jesus has left the eastern shores of the Sea of Galilee, the country of the Gerasenes, at the request of the people there because of the disruption he'd caused in their lives when he cast a legion of demons out of a possessed man from that area, as we saw last week. And so now he's back on the western or probably northwestern side of the lake, most likely at Capernaum, where his popularity is at an all-time high as seen by the massive crowds that continue to gather and, as Mark puts it, throng about him, which is, of course, nothing new if you've been reading through this with us, except this time. This time something out of the ordinary happens, at least as far as the Jewish religious leadership is concerned, because up to now they have rigorously opposed Jesus at every turn. In fact, they're actually in league with their political opponents, the Herodians at this point, plotting Jesus' death, which we saw back in chapter 3, which makes this part of the story all the more surprising because among the crowd, there was a man named Jairus who was a ruler of the synagogue. And the, the synagogue rulers, or presidents as they were often referred to, were somewhat like uh, pastors of local churches today. They managed the spiritual and business affairs of the synagogue, including the worship and the instruction and even the care uh, of the facilities. So this was a very important, very highly respected and influential member of the Jewish religious hierarchy. And yet, while his peers are plotting to kill Jesus, Jairus is falling down at Jesus' feet, begging him to heal his daughter. And as we'll see later, his fellow religious Jews were less than thrilled that he'd done so, and yet it wasn't their daughters who were dying. It was Jairus' daughter. And make no mistake about it, the situation was desperate, seemingly hopeless, in fact. When he says, my little daughter is at the point of death, that phrase 
point of death was not hyperbole. You know, like when we have a bad cold and, and someone asks you how you're doing and because you feel horrible, you say, oh, I feel like I'm dying, even though we're far from dying, right? That's hyperbole, exaggeration. This was not hyperbole. Okay, when Jairus says that his little girl is at the point of death, it's the ancient Greek word eschatos, which is literally translated as the extremity of life. It's also the root word for eschatology. That's the part of theology concerned with death and judgment and the final destiny of the soul. In other words, this little girl was literally in the final moments of her life on this earth, and her father knew it. The circumstances couldn't be any worse. In fact, at this point, Jairus' daughter appeared to be a hopeless cause. And yet this Jewish religious leader, of all people, he seemed to understand that there was something different about this Jesus, something not only compassionate, but something powerful. And so he falls at Jesus' feet in great desperation and implores him, come lay your hands on her so that she may be made well and live. See, unlike his peers, this particular Jewish ruler seemed to understand that even when there's no hope in your circumstances, there's still hope in Jesus. It's confirmed by the fact that Jesus agrees to go with him to see the man's daughter, right? Jesus could have easily said, well, I'd come to see your daughter if she wasn't quite so bad off. But honestly, there's no point now, right? She's too close to death. She's, she's a hopeless cause, but that's not what Jesus said. Even better yet, knowing this was a ruler of the synagogue, a man whose friends were literally trying to kill Jesus, he could have said, I'll tell you what, I'll come to see your daughter if you call your friends off first. In other words, prove yourself to me. You do something for me, then I'll do something for you. But that's not what Jesus said either, because he doesn't require us to have our act together or our circumstances cleaned up before we can come to him. You hear me? You don't have to clean up your act before you come to Jesus. No matter how profoundly screwed up your circumstances are, you can come to him just like you are. In fact, Jesus prefers it that way. He didn't say, come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, as soon as you get your act together, and I will give you rest. No. He simply said, come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Matthew eleven twenty eight, 28. Jairus was guilty by association. The people he ran with were trying to figure out how to murder Jesus. And yet the moment his circumstances became desperate, he didn't try to distance himself from the other religious Jews first. He didn't try to conceal his true identity first. And he didn't apologize for how Jesus had been treated first. No, he just threw himself down at Jesus' feet and said, Please help me. I need you. We could learn a lot from this ruler of the synagogue, okay? When your life is a mess, when your circumstances are hopeless, when you're at your wit's end, you don't have to try and figure out the solution first. You don't have to try to understand the problem better first. And you don't have to clean up your act first. Just throw yourself down at the feet of Christ and cry out to him, Jesus, please help me. I need you. And he says, come to me, all all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Yet as clear as Jesus was about that, this seems to be a real problem for a lot of people today, including Christians. And here's why. The reason why so many people struggle with coming directly to Christ when their circumstances are hopeless is because often we help to create those circumstances. It's so mired down, we become in our own feelings of guilt and shame. We think there's no point in coming to Jesus because we're getting what we deserve. Listen, I'm here to tell you, deserve's got nothing to do with it. If we got what we deserve, none of us would be here. Well, what about my guilt then? What about my shame? What about my part in these hopeless circumstances? What about the part that I helped to cause? Listen, do you think any of that is more than Jesus can handle? Jesus. 
No, Jairus understood that even when there's no hope in your circumstances, there's still hope in Jesus, even when you help create those circumstances. So quite frankly, I don't care what you've done or been a part of. Just take all of that guilt and all of that shame and all of that hopelessness with you right to the feet of Jesus, then drop it all right there in front of him along with yourself and cry out, Jesus, help me, I need you. And he will give you rest. Jairus could have easily said to himself, there's no point in going to Jesus because my own tribe, the very people I work for and with, are trying to kill him. He could have easily accepted that his circumstances were a hopeless cause, but he didn't. He went to Jesus anyway, and as we'll see, he made the right decision, but not before we find another seemingly hopeless cause in our story. So let's keep reading verses 25 through 34. And there was a woman who had a discharge of blood for 12 years and who had suffered much under many physicians and had spent all that she had and was no better but rather grew worse. She had heard the reports about Jesus and came up behind him in the crowd and touched his garment. For she said, if I touch even his garments, I will be made well. And immediately the flow of blood dried up and she felt in her body that she was healed of her disease. And Jesus, perceiving in himself that power had gone out from him, immediately turned about in the crowd and said, who touched my garments? And his disciples said to him, You see the crowd pressing around you, and yet you say, Who touched me? And he looked around to see who had done it. But the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came in fear and trembling and fell down before him and told him the whole truth. And he said to her, Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your disease. So just as Jesus is making his way to Jairus' house, and keep in mind, this little girl's need is urgent. There really is no time to waste if Jesus is to make it there before she dies. And yet, as he presses his way through the crowds, he feels power being transferred from himself into someone else. And of course, it's this woman who's in desperate need of healing. She's been hemorrhaging for 12 straight years and probably wasn't going to live much longer just based on the massive risk in doing what she did. You see, according uh, to the Old Testament law, this woman was in a perpetual state of ceremonial uncleanness, which meant according to Leviticus 15, uh, 19 through 33, she could not effectively be a part of the community socially or religiously. And we know from Flavius Josephus, the first century Jewish historian, that these laws prohibiting women with any kind of discharge of blood from entering the temple were still strictly being enforced in Jesus' day, which meant for this woman, she hasn't been able to worship in the temple for over a decade. Furthermore, no one could touch her. No one could touch her clothes or anything else that she touched or they too would become unclean, which meant just by being in this crowd to begin with, she was directly and willfully breaking the ceremonial law, which she certainly would not have risked had her situation not become hopeless. In fact, in addition to the physical ailment, the social rejection and the religious isolation because of her condition, she was also poverty stricken utterly destitute from spending all of her money on doctors who tried to help her in every way possible, but they simply were unable to find a cure. Interestingly, I was uh, reading this week the list of treatments in the Talmud. That's the primary ancient text of rabbinic Judaism. And in that text, there's actually a list of remedies for treating women with a discharge of blood, this very condition suffered by the woman in our story. And so the first treatment prescribed was for the patient to drink a goblet full of wine containing a powder compounded from rubber, alum, and garden crocuses. If that didn't work, the patient would be instructed to consume a dose of Persian onions cooked in wine administered to her with the summons, arise out of your flow of blood. If both of those failed, the physician would prescribe a sudden shock Apparently, the idea was to scare them out of their ailment. I don't know. And finally, if all else failed, the patient was ordered to carry around the ash of an ostrich's egg in a special cloth. Doubtless, she tried all of these remedies, and who knows what else, and she paid for them, all of them, and kept paying for them until she was flat broke and bleeding worse than ever. And yet, this was the very best that the world had to offer her in the first century A.D., her doctors couldn't heal her. 
Her religion couldn't save her, and her own people couldn't help her. To the world, this woman was a hopeless cause. And so probably nearing the end of her life without healing, she risked everything just to get close to Jesus. In fact, it was a common belief at the time that if a person carried a certain amount of power, that power was also carried in their clothing, which would explain her thought that simply touching Jesus' garments, actually probably just the tassel on the corner of his outer garment, which was worn by all observant Jews. You'll find that in Numbers 15, 38 and 39, and Deuteronomy 22, 12. So she, she most likely believed that just touching one of these tassels would heal her because she'd heard all the stories about the power Jesus had, power to heal and deliver people from otherwise hopeless causes. And so she was willing to blatantly disobey the law, going where the people were, pressing in through the crowd, no doubt defiling many others as she bumped into them on the way. But it was a risk she was willing to take just to get close enough to touch the tassel on the corner of Jesus' clothing. You see, she seemed to understand that even when there's no hope in this world, there's still hope in Jesus. Look, the truth is, this world has a lot to offer us. That's true. And yet everything this world offers us combined pales in comparison to what Jesus offers us. And yet that truth won't do much for you if you don't act on it. And you won't act on it as long as your hope is tied up in this world and what it can or cannot do for you, okay? It all boils down to where your hope resides, in this world or in Jesus. As far as the world is concerned, this woman's disease was incurable, and indeed for the world it was. And by the way, uh, as a side note, this story is not a slight against the medical profession or the medical professionals who were trying to help her. They were simply doing the best they could with what they had. The, the fact is, medical science and medical professionals are a gift from God. They were then, and they are today. And of course, we have a lot more to work with now. Thank the Lord we're not still carrying around charred ostrich eggs and cloths anymore, which means we're benefiting from the medical profession and its professionals like never before. But listen, sometimes there comes a point when everything that this world has to offer you is still not enough to meet your need. Whatever the need is, physical, material, relational, whatever it is, right? When your doctors have done all they can do, when your employers offer you all that they can, when your friends give you all the advice they have, when everything available to you still isn't enough to meet your need, and it's beginning to look like a hopeless cause, there's still hope in Jesus. This woman tried everything there was to try, and still it wasn't enough. And yet, rather than accepting that hers was a hopeless cause, rather than choosing hopelessness because of what the world could not provide for her, she chose to put her hope in Jesus and what he could provide for her, which, as we'll see, was much more than just physical healing. And listen, that hope is what determined her response to Jesus when he showed up on her side of the lake. Because what you put your hope in is what you respond to every time. If ultimately your hope is in this world, then you will respond to this world more than you do to Jesus. Whereas if your hope is truly in Jesus, then you will respond to him and what he says regardless of what the world is telling you. And of course, as, uh, as church attending Christians, We've been trained to say that our hope is in Christ. It's our mantra, as it should be, as long as that's actually true. Because I have to be honest with you, there's no shortage of Christians in the modern church today who are struggling with feelings of hopelessness. And the reason for that is because although we say that our hope is in Christ, we've actually vested most of our hope in this world. And so when the world says you're a failure, we believe it. Even though God says, you're a crown of beauty in the hand of the Lord, Isaiah 62, 3. When the world says your worth is measured by what you own, we believe it. Even though God says your worth is measured by every drop of blood that Jesus shed for you on a Roman cross before you even knew him. God shows us his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us, Romans 5, 8. When the world says, you'll never be happy again because of your circumstances, we believe it. Even though God's word says we rejoice 
in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces what? Endurance. And endurance produces character, and character produces hope. Romans 5, 3, and 4. And yet, when the world says, your life on this earth is over, we believe it. Even though God's word says in your book were written every one of them, the days that were formed for me when as yet there was none of them. Psalm 139, 16, which means you are not leaving this earth until God says it's time for you to come home. So why? Why is it that when the world tells us we're a hopeless cause, we believe it? It's because we've placed our hope in this world instead of in Jesus Christ. The truth is, we could learn a lot from this lonely, rejected, destitute, broken, and diseased woman who decided to place every last drop of hope she had into Jesus. The moment she touched his garment, she was physically healed, and yet that was just the tip of the iceberg for her because as Jesus calls her out and she throws herself down at his feet, telling him everything that had happened to her, he says to her, Daughter, your faith has made you well. In the ancient Greek, that phrase, has made you well, is the word sozo. It means to save. And if you look at the, actually the spoken version of that word in both the Hebrew and the Aramaic, it's the word yasha, which is another version of the Hebrew name for Jesus, Yeshua. You see, this is much more than just a physical healing. Jesus was saying to her that through your faith, I'm saving you, not just physically, but spiritually as well. And then as he finishes his interaction with her, he says, go in peace and be healed of your disease, which can also be translated as go in peace and be whole. The world told her she was done. Jesus said, your life is just beginning. You understand, she could have stayed at home and wallowed in her misery, believing everything this world had said about her and we wouldn't be reading this story today. But instead she got up and acting on the hope she placed in Jesus in spite of what the world said about her, she pressed into him in her darkest hour and he saved her and he made her whole. Okay, what your hope is in, that's what you're going to respond to. And so listen, if you find yourself more affected by what this world says about you than what God's word says about you, well then your hope may not be in Jesus as much as you think it is, and maybe it's time that changed. In the Greek tradition, this woman's name was Berenice. The Coptic and Latin traditions both referred to, who, to her as Veronica. It's actually, those names are related between those languages. And interestingly, Eusebius, the 3rd and 4th century historian known as the father of church history, wrote that he once actually went to the house where Berenice had lived in Caesar, uh, Caesarea Philippi. And outside of her front door, he said, there was a copper statue of a woman kneeling with her hands outstretched before Jesus as a permanent reminder of where our true hope lies. Let's finish our story for today. Verse 35 to the end of the chapter. While he was still speaking, there came from the ruler's house someone who said, your daughter is dead. Why trouble the teacher any further? But overhearing what they said, Jesus said to the ruler of the synagogue, Do not fear, only believe. And he allowed no one to follow him except Peter and James and John, the brother of James. They came to the house of the ruler of the synagogue, and Jesus saw a commotion, people weeping and wailing loudly. And when he had entered, he said to them, Why are you making a commotion and weeping? The child is not dead, but sleeping. And they laughed at him. But he put them all outside and took the child's father and mother and those who were with him and went in where the child was. Taking her by the hand, he said to her, Talitha kumi, that's actually Aramaic, which means little girl, I say to you, arise. And immediately the girl got up and began walking, for she was 12 years of age. And they were immediately overcome with amazement. And he strictly charged them that no one should know this and told them to give her something to eat. So as Jesus was making his way to this little girl, he's interrupted by the woman with the issue of blood. And as a result of the time he took to discover the woman's identity, to question her, to listen to her entire story, and then to bless her, he doesn't make it to the house in time to heal this little girl before she dies. Imagine you're the parents, the sheer distress, 
of knowing that Jesus may have made it in time if this woman hadn't caused him to stop. And so now whatever glimmer of hope they may have had that Jesus could heal their daughter was now gone as the girl is dead and all hope is lost. To make matters worse, his friends encourage him to cancel the visit with Jesus as they remind him rather sarcastically, your daughter is dead, why trouble the teacher any further? But Jesus overheard them. So he turns to the man and essentially says to them, listen, I know you're feeling hopeless right now, but trust me, this isn't over yet. And so he continues on to the man's house where they're met by a group of professional mourners. In ancient Jewish custom, whenever there was a death, the family of the deceased was instructed to hire professional mourners who would come to your house and actually tear their garments and weep and wail loudly and play instruments as a sign of the tragedy that had befallen the family and how large the party of professional mourners was was determined by the wealth of the family. And so uh, I was reading in the Mishnah, the first uh, ancient written record of rabbinic oral tradition. It says that even, I'm quoting, even the poorest in Israel should hire not less than two flutes and one wailing woman. And of course, this ruler of the synagogue was not poor by any stretch. This was a wealthy man, which means the size of the crowd there weeping and wailing at his house that day was significantly large. And so Jesus says, why are you making a commotion and weeping? The child is not dead, but sleeping. That word uh, sleeping, by the way, when used in the context of someone dying was a euphemism. is often used in biblical scripture to refer to actual death, which means as far as what the world could do for this little girl, she was a hopeless cause because she was all the way dead. What Jesus was actually saying was, listen, stop your crying. Death doesn't have the final word over this little girl. I do. And so the professional mourners laughed at him because they'd been around death many, many times before. They knew exactly what it looked like, and this was it. And yet her father, this religious Jew, recognized something different in Jesus. Even though his daughter was dead, even though his friends told him to give it up, and even though the professionals laughed at the idea that there was any hope left for his daughter whatsoever, the man understood that even when all hope seems to be lost, there's still hope in Jesus. Because no matter what your circumstances are, no matter what the world says about you, and no matter how bad the situation becomes, Jesus always has the final word. Forget difficult. This family's circumstances were impossible. And yet they chose to put their hope in Jesus instead of their circumstances. And with nothing more than a word, Jesus brought life out of death. And he can do the very same thing for you today. So look, I, I don't know. I don't know what you may be up against. I do know some of you are facing some really difficult circumstances in your lives. And of course, this world has a way of beating you down if you let it. Maybe you've chosen to believe that what the world says about what you're facing. In fact, maybe it's gotten so bad that you've actually come to accept that yours is a hopeless cause. Listen to me. I may not know exactly what you're up against today, but I do know this. If there is hope for new life for a little girl who is dead long before Jesus could get to her, then no matter what you are going through today, there is hope for you. In fact, for the believer and follower of Jesus Christ, hopelessness is actually nothing more than a false perception of what is real because your hope is not based on what your circumstances are or what the world says about you as you deal with those circumstances. No. Your hope is based on who Jesus is and what he says about you. Which means your reality is the fact that you are never without hope because you are never without Christ. So don't allow yourself to get stuck in the spiritual paralysis that hopelessness inevitably brings. Don't stop moving forward with your life, even when it seems hopeless, because nothing this world can do to you can ever hold a candle to what Jesus wants to do through you, even in the midst of those circumstances, even when they seem to be impossible and hopeless. In fact, 
That's where Jesus does his best work. That's where he writes your story. We see it over and over and over again in Scripture. Jesus doing great things in people's lives out of impossible circumstances because with Jesus there are no hopeless causes. Only great stories being written in the most challenging times of our lives as we place all of our hope in him. So listen, don't despair. Don't give up. And don't allow yourself to get stuck believing that what you're facing is a hopeless cause because in Christ you are only ever one cry away, one touch away, one word away from a whole new chapter of your life full of promise and healing and yes, even hope. Let's pray.